today I'll talk about how we got it all wrong, why we got it all wrong, and how we can possibly get it right, hopefully. And uh, I'll be talking from a neuroscientific perspective because that's what I'm specialized in. But first, let me share a few photos of things that are very precious to me, if you like. That's Lily, my dog, and you'll understand why she's important. That's Anais, my niece, and you'll understand why she's important as well. And that's Dr. Mohammed Abla, who's a famous Egyptian visual artist, and you'll understand how the three are related. Um, before I explain any of that stuff, let me talk a bit about the boring neuroscientific stuff. When we learn, we learn through different ways. And the first one is possibly Im imitation. So when you see a little baby and you stick your tongue out at the baby, the baby will imitate that. Meltsoff and Moore, back in the day, uh, looked at newborn infants and they realized that yes, if you do stick your tongue out, the baby will imitate that. You can try this at home. Um, and the babies will imitate the various visual effects that you're making. An imitation involves a human agent and a salient effect. Now, another way of learning is through stimulus enhancement and emulation. And that doesn't necessarily involve an agent, but it involves maybe trial and error. So a good example is a baby monkey and a mommy monkey. And maybe there's a log and there's food underneath the log. Now mommy monkey doesn't have to show baby monkey how to do it. The monkey understands somehow that the log affords to be turned and that there is food underneath. So in that case, you have a salient goal, which is the food and you have the trial and error, and that's emulation. Now, the, uh, finally, you have something called mimicking, and that's basically repeating a behavior. It doesn't really involve a goal or anything, so I won't really be talking about mimicking. Again, imitation, human agent, salient effect, emulation, stimulus enhancement, st uh, trial and error, salient effect, no human agent. Now, back in the day at the Max Planck, what we did is that we had little babies in what was called the baby lab and what is still called the baby lab. And we presented those babies with uh, two buttons, a red button and a, a blue button. And we saw that we realized that if I were to press the blue button, for example, and you had a salient effect, i.e. it glows and it makes a nice sound, the kid were more likely to repeat that and do it over and over again. So the frequency is higher and the latency is, is higher as well. Meanwhile, somewhere in Italy, guys came up with an extremely, extremely interesting observation. And I'll, since I don't have any props, I'm going to ask you to try and, and imagine me picking up a glass of water and drinking that. Now, as you imagine or you see me do that action, the neurons in your brain are firing as if you were performing that action itself. And it's in the cortex of your brain. And there they did an experiment with a macaque monkey, and it was Rizzolatti and his team. And they realized what we call, now call mirror neurons. Now, here's the monkey observing someone pick up a peanut. The same neurons are firing in the monkey's brain as if the monkey itself was picking up the peanut. Now, that, when that was done by a mechanical claw, or tweezers in this case, the neurons didn't fire. Interestingly enough, somewhere else in the world, someone decided to do that with a human baby. And the interesting thing was, when the toy was picked up, i.e. the salient effect was picked up by a mechanical claw, the neurons fired, which is quite amazing. It shows that maybe there's something else going on. And maybe we imitate for the sake of imitation. And maybe, as it, the Wolfgang Prinz and the Max Planck assumed, 
that we have something called the common coding theory, i.e. actions are coded in their outcomes. So imitation is coded for the sake of imitation. And then I decided back in the day also to do another experiment. What if my action was a counterintuitive action? So what if, what if the procedure was a bit more complex? And in that case, I recall back then a touch screen was this big and I was walking around with a huge touch screen in a, in a, at university and back in the, in the marketplace trying to recruit subjects and those subjects were toddlers and I used quite a lot of toddlers for my experiment and it was quite, sometimes quite freaky for the parents to see a young student walk around with a suitcase asking the parents, well can I use your baby for an experiment, you'll get eight pounds and a free video. So it quite freaky, however they participated, and I decided to do the following. Now most of you don't know who Woody Woodpecker is, it's that thing over there, and it goes hey, hey. So it creates a salient effect, and it looks kind of cool. And I decided to do the following, I decided to, what if I press on a certain button on a screen, and the salient effect happens somewhere else, so on a different button on that screen. Will the child repeat that, yes or no? What if in a second condition, I press the button and nothing happens? Will the child do that, yes or no? And also I wanted to look at emulation, stimulus enhancement. What if I did absolutely nothing and an arrow descended on the button? Will that be repeated if there was a goal? Would you Woodpecker coming out? Finally, the final condition, an arrow descends, nothing happened. Now I'll take you somewhere else in the world because meanwhile, as I was doing that, the guy called Mohammed Abla was somewhere in Switzerland. He had students and he realized that people actually enjoyed using this weird different method. And it was them tracing one another. So he would put a blank um, screen, a transparent screen, and have people trace one another. And people actually enjoyed that. Kind of strange, but I'll explain why. Going back to my experiment, I realized the following. When I press the button, Woody Woodpecker comes out, the frequency was really high. Now, so that's hand with outcome. When you had the hand, me pressing the button, no outcome, frequency extremely high as well. And that's the latency in brackets. When there was an arrow, emulation, nothing going on, then frequency is really low, so it, we didn't get any results there. When there was an arrow and the salient effect, kids repeated that over and over again. So what does this really tell us about us? It's quite amazing. فبالمصري بالعربي كفاية وجودي هنا كفاية مش لازم إن على طول يكون عندك بروفيسور بيقعد يشرح لك حاجة وجودك مع حد ده كفاية طب وليه المشين ممكن تتعلم أحسن مننا لأن الناس بتوع الـ AI بيستعملوا شغلنا إحنا بتوع الـ Neuroscience علشان يخلقوا ماكنة تشتغل والماكنة دي ليه في رأيي ممكن قوي إنها تميوتيت وتبقى أحسن مننا لأن إحنا عندنا حاجة اسمها social construction عندنا حاجة اسمها صح وغلط عندنا حاجة اسمها المكنة ولا ليلي ولا أي حد تاني هيعملها إنه لا مش هعمل الـ الـ هقف في طريقي مش هعمل الموضوع ده علشان حد بيبصلي غلط I doubt the machine will do the same thing I doubt the machine will be stuck in social construction I doubt the machine will think about um, whether it said the right thing at the wrong time or the wrong thing at the right time. It just moves on. However, we are stuck in, in our own way because you're not really letting your brain do the action for you. You're not really letting your brain fire for you. And then you become someone who's just standing in their own way. 
with history, you can see that as well. When the idea, for example, of a nuclear family was invented, maybe in the 60s, that the perfect family, the perfect coexistence is a father, a mother, two kids, they work, and this is the family, this is a social construction, and you're being stuck in that. Now, as said before, uh, in, in five, six years ago, Egypt was in a chaotic state. And given that chaotic state, I observed something really weird. I observed people who would, واحد كان نازل كده كده هياخد عياله ويتصوروا جنب زرافة قرر يصورهم جنب حاجة بتتحرق وكده. Now a machine or lily will not do that. And the amazing thing about us humans is that we imitate for the sake of imitation. We exist for the sake of existence and we communicate for the sake of communication. So we don't really need that woody woodpecker, that glowing light or that salient goal. Just communicating or being around one another is good enough. So in sum, and I'll make it short but sweet, all those experiments were done ages ago, and that, by that I mean possibly in the late 1900s, early 2000s. Now we're in 2017. And I would like to ask you not to use your brain, but to let your brain use you, to let your brain function well, because it's functioning perfectly. And my being here is just to communicate that. Now, as a final point, I recall when I came back from France, I met with an old friend, and that friend was trying to learn French. And they asked me if I recommended any book. And I said, well, Albert Camus is a, is a good book. You can read about l'étranger or whatever. And that friend from Egypt told me, لا, لو حاجة هتخش مخي تلعب في مخي مش أقراها. فيش حاجة هتلعب في مخك, ما فيش حاجة هتخش في مخك. انت اللي بتقعد تقيد نفسك وتخش في مخك انت نفسك ومش سايب مخك هو يشتغل سيب مخك هو يشتغل and you'll be just fine thank you very much